I, I, I'd like you to be as daring as you can and, uh, and as perceptive as only you can be as someone who knows the United States, all of the United States very well. What do you predict is going to happen in this political year in that country? You know, it's, I mean, I th thank you. Um, I couldn't be more grateful to be an American. I've always felt that way. Um, as I said, my dad's family was from Nova Scotia. They left at the time of the American Revolution because they didn't want to be free, so they fled to the Maritimes. And um, I'm just kidding. But anyway, and then they came back. Uh, ultimately, many are still there. Uh, their name is Ray Fuse. I think they're liberal. But, um, but I have always been grateful for my birthright as an American and for the... Are you grateful for your birthright as an American? Or are you grateful for your birthright as a spoiled rich kid? Because Tucker Carlson comes from a very affluent family. So, you know, it's pretty easy to be proud to be an American when you're born with not just a silver, but a gold spoon in your mouth, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit different of an American experience for a wealthy kid. And I would know because... I was pretty wealthy when I was a kid. I mean, I wasn't. My dad was. But we lost it all. My dad's uh, diploma mill, his little scam he was running, was shut down by the FBI. And he got locked up and all of his assets were seized. And so I went from being a very rich kid living in a mansion to within a few years living in a trailer. So I got to experience both sides of America. That's my experience. I got to be the rich kid with a jet ski and, you know, every entertainment system and every video game and every toy and everything I wanted. All the stuff just on demand. Ah, it's all mine. To, we're probably going to get kicked out of this place again, kids. Can't pay the rent. So I got to experience amazing economic prosperity in this country, and I got to experience crippling, horrible poverty in this country. That's my unique upbringing and experience. I mean, it's not completely unique, but I don't think most people get that sort of... <sighs> and I can tell you, I'll tell you something my dad used to say. He used to tell me, you know, TJ... I've been poor, and I've been rich, and I'll tell you one thing. Rich is better. Because rich is better. A lot better. It's way the fuck different to be rich than it is to be poor in America. And probably anywhere else. So I wonder if it's really his American birthright that he's grateful for. I think it's probably his rich kid birthright that he's actually grateful for. Hey, if you like this clip, you might like the full stream, which I do every Sunday, more or less, over on the Pessimist Productions Patreon. Link down below. Thank you kindly. The God-given rights that are protected by my government officially in the Bill of Rights, which is a beautiful document, the greatest document we've ever produced. They're not God-given rights. They were written by man. Men fought and died for them. A lot of those men were not Christians, by the way. A lot of them were deists. A lot of them were probably atheists. And that no other country has. So, um, and I will feel that way till I die. And unlike a lot of people in our leadership class, I have no plans to go anywhere else. I've got too many children and too many dogs and I'm dying there. Uh, you know, you have enough money that you could take your children and dogs with you somewhere else if you really wanted to, so doesn't really make sense as a rationale. Uh, but I'm definitely very concerned, and I can't see the outcome of this year clearly at all. I was thinking... Ah, the cop-out. Not willing to make a prediction, huh? Well, maybe he'll... Maybe he'll... Maybe he's just hedging his bets, you know? Wants to let us know, all right, I'm going to make some predictions, but I'm not confident in those predictions because things are just so crazy right now. Thinking yesterday, it really is like looking through a shower curtain. You see these opaque shapes lurking, but you can't tell if they're 
you know, friend or foe, nude or clothed. You know, you don't really know what you're looking at, but you know that there is a collision. That's an interesting analogy, <laughs> right? I mean, like, there's a lot of things he could have talked. I mean, I guess it makes sense. I just think it's kind of interesting that, like, he puts himself in the horror ingenue sort of um, predicament, right? He's Janet Lee in Psycho. Who's that looming behind the shower curtain? Is it friend? Is it foe? Do they come bearing gifts or do they come bearing a blade with which to rend my flesh asunder? <laughs> I don't know. Just, I mean, I'm not saying anything about the guy, I guess, uh, with that one. I'm just, uh, I think it's an interesting analogy. ...coming between titanic forces, the population of America versus its leaders. And it's coming to a head because of the structure of this election. And so you have the Republican candidate, and he is going to be the candidate, whose election is the one thing... Yeah! Woo! Trump! 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 Who, by the way, we know how Tucker Carlson really feels about Trump because we saw the leaked, um, you know, text messages where he's basically talking to his friends about how Trump is a shit show. But of course, the public facing Tucker is like, oh, Trump, yes, yes, very wise man. They don't care that it's just plainly, flatly out there. This guy does not like Trump. They don't call him a phony they don't say ah tucker you're full of shit they just accept it yeah i mean he said trump sucks in private but i'm sure that was the lie what he says publicly to us that's the truth i don't know why they'd assume that but apparently they do what well, i think it's i think it's it's kind of determined um and of course it's politics so it's filled with all sorts of i mean the amount of ugliness display beneath the surface in all politics everywhere is really awe-inspiring you know these people are really dirty everywhere not just my country you may know about that but um the one thing that the people in power and i don't just mean in washington in our government i mean in our financial center has this uh guy said anything yet because I'm listening, and I'm hearing words, but I've yet to hear anything actually be conveyed. So I'm waiting for that. I'm waiting for the moment that there's finally something I can actually <sighs> sink my teeth into a little bit. Because right now, I feel like it's just, well, you know, it's hard to make predictions because the people behind the shower curtain could be friend or foe and... A lot of dirty fucking motherfuckers in this country and shit, so you know how it is, but, um, you know. <laughs> like, all right. Enough prefacing. Get to it. Centers and entertainment centers, our country's kind of cool because they're, they're identified by cities. So Los Angeles, New York, Washington uh -huh. make all the decisions, of course. And the one thing they won't tolerate is the orange man in power. And you sort of... No, well, they tolerated it just fine last time. I mean, I don't know. What do you mean? He was in power before. In fact, plenty of the people in power gave him billions of dollars. And guess what he did for them? Lowered their taxes. So I'm pretty sure most of them are actually pretty all right with Orange Man. They're, you know who isn't all right with Orange Man? The opposition party. Which, isn't that kind of like their job? Isn't that the job of the opposition party to like, I don't know, oppose? I mean, you act like the Republicans aren't right now gunning for Biden, hating everything Biden's doing, calling Biden a communist. Like, this is just the nature of American politics. The opposition party guns for the leader of the other party. That's what happens. That's not weird. That's not strange. The only thing that is strange in all of this is not anything the Democrats have done. It's what Trump tried to do. Hold on to power after he lost an election. That was the weird thing. That was the thing that was actually out of the fucking ordinary. 
and that, like, you wonder, well, why? Because Trump is not a radical at all. And Trump's vision for America, this is an informed assessment of Trump, Trump's vision for America is like Studio 54, What? How? Huh? Like... Studio 54. The raucous party club full of super attractive people having anonymous sex and doing big old fucking rails of cocaine and just engaging in general debauchery. How the fuck does that have any fucking thing to do with this weird, repressive, spangly ass MAGA horse shit? How are those two things? even remotely fucking similar. What? Who doesn't want to do cocaine and debauch? I mean, that's the point. If that was what Trump wanted, why didn't he just fucking say so? Okay. Yeah, if Trump comes out and says, hey guys, you know how I think we can make America great again? We need to get some fucking blow in here. We need to fucking do drugs and fuck till the cows come home. And then we'll fuck the cows. If that was the Trump message, I'd be like, that's a cool motherfucker. He's got my vote. But he's not that. He's a guy that sat next to Pat Roberts. I'm going to restore biblical values to America. What the fucking fuck? How the fuck is this guy one of the most respected political commentators on the fucking right? How the fuck does anyone, regardless of ideology, listen to that and go like, yup. Like, do they just have no critical thinking skills? Do they just not question anything they fucking hear? All right. Tucker, please elaborate on how exactly what you just said makes a lick of sense. I'm ready. <laughs> like, tr I'm serious. Trump really loved the country he grew up in. He really loved it, he, and he means it. He loved the people who live there. He loved its traditions, its weird little customs, its idiosyncrasies, and that's kind of what he wants. He doesn't want a brave new future of new things. He wants to return not to antebellum America, but to like 1980 America. And it's kind of hard to argue why that's bad, actually. And so. I don't know where you're getting that. I don't know where you're getting that. I flatly just don't understand what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> Are you. Are you saying that Trump was trying to, like, do some kind of Ronald Reagan shit? He was trying to, I don't know, get America back, back on track or whatever the fuck. I mean, I guess there was, to be fair to Tucker's point, sort of a duality 
to 1980s America. Because on one hand, yes, you had Ronald Reagan in office talking about the Bible and the good moral majority. But on the other hand, America at that time was a hotbed of cocaine and sex and drugs and rock and roll. Maybe that's where he's getting it. Like Trump might say it's about tradition and traditional values and all this like God bothering shit. But at the end of the day, what it's really about is cocaine and fast cars and big jets and big tanks. And yeah, America's back, baby. Is that what's going on? Because, I mean, someone should have fucking told me if that's what's going on, because I'll fucking vote for Trump in a goddamn heartbeat if that's if that's the plan. If the plan is drugs and sex and cars, and I don't mean, I don't really give that much of a shit about cars, but whatever. And big explosions and big tits, like, all right. Fuck yeah, let's do it. <laughs> he should have led with that. So that's not a revolutionary agenda, nor is it a counter-revolutionary agenda. It's a return to normalcy. And the phrase make America great again means return it to a period not so long ago. When You know, it's funny because I actually have a video. I don't know if I'll get to it because it was the last thing on my slate. But I actually have a video of a bunch of Trump supporters being talked to. And maybe, you know what? Maybe I'll just interweave it into this segment because it seems like now is actually the time to fucking play the thing. This is a bunch of Trump supporters being asked when America was great. So I want to see how many of these people say the 80s. What does MAGA mean to you then? So make America great again. What does that mean to you? The America I grew up with, we want it back. We want people to stop censoring us. We want them to stay away from our Second Amendment. We want freedom of, uh, freedom of religion. So if you're a conservative, if you're a Christian, if you're white, you're male, it doesn't matter what color you are. We want people to be respected for who they are. We don't need to have stones of infinity stones. I feel like I'm in Studio 54 right now, dude. <laughs> we just want, like, you know, freedom of, well, not speech, fuck that. Freedom of religion. And we want, um, you know, like, our guns that no one ever has taken from us and we've always had. And we just want people not to censor us, which they haven't done because there's been no crackdown on freedom of speech at all. So, uh, yeah, we just want, you know, all the, we just want all this stuff that's, you know, all the persecution that's not happening to us to stop happening to us. <laughs> I feel like I'm in studio 54 right now, man. I can't wait to fucking do a line of coke with this fella. It is a real party animal. Because you're black, you're gay, you're trans. We just want everybody to be treated equal. And they're trying to say that we're the, the party of the racist party when they're the ones actually won Jim Crow rules back. And what way? Well, way, um, colleges. They want to have black and white graduations. They want to separate us. Where do they, where do they want that? Uh, what colleges? Man, look. Okay, I don't know. Google it. <laughs> Where is this happening? Um, in my fevered imagination. <laughs> Make America great again. What does that mean to you? What's the again? To me, the again means that we have somewhere safe where we can have those freedoms that we are so lucky to enjoy. There are so many people throughout the world that do not have what we have, and it is a blessing. That's why we have people. I think America, let me check this fucking freedom shit real quick. Let me just fact check this for a second. Switzerland, New Zealand, Denmark, Ireland, Sweden, Estonia, Iceland, Luxembourg, Finland, Norway, Netherlands, Taiwan, Canada, Australia, Latvia, Japan, America. So where would that, where would we rank there? I hope someone actually did count along and figure that out for me. <laughs> Cause I'm not doing it, but I hate this idea that we're just so much freer here than we are. They are people are anywhere else. And I mean, I realized that was bullshit. I mean, I realized it before I actually went to Europe 
But when I was in Europe, I was like, yeah, this is all the same shit. None of this is all that different from where I'm from. 18th. Someone says 17th. Someone says 18th. So we're in that ballpark. Yeah, I mean, that's not a bad score. But America's supposed to be number one, right? We're supposed to be number one. Maybe these Trumpers think if Trump was back in charge, we would be number one. But it really didn't seem like there was a huge uptick in freedom when Trump was in office to me. I don't know what freedoms I had under Trump that I don't still have under Biden, for instance. Like, I would be curious if they could name one for me. Maybe there is one. I don't know. People that want to be here and we will fully encompass all of that greatness again. When do we last have it if it's again? I feel like we did have that when when President Trump was in office. Um, I feel like we can work with what he built on in the first um, presidency and make it even better. When he was running in 2016, it was before he'd even been president, but he was still saying make it great again. Again from when? Um, that is a good question. I would say if I could guess it would be, um, and I think that they're very politically um, lined up, would be maybe with JFK. So she's and saying when he was the president 60s. and what we embodied with some optimism and um, freedoms that we didn't have I mean, have I don't before. know. The 60s were a very fucking tumultuous time. Like, talk about under Kennedy. I mean, that was like Cuban Missile Crisis, civil rights protest, massive social unrest. You know, um, I'm not saying Kennedy was necessarily a bad president or anything, but like, was this, is this really the golden age of America that we have to hearken back to? Like, we couldn't do any better than that? Okay. And trying to find that. When was America last great? Four years ago, or three years ago. Well, he was saying it before he got there. He was saying, make it great again. So he didn't think, what, 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 did, that, what did that message mean to you then? I felt Reagan, President Reagan was an excellent. All right, well, president. she's saying the 80s. So there's, a, there's another chick saying the 80s. too. And nobody between Reagan and, and Trump. I am not a Democrat, so. Well, you had George. Well, there were Republicans in between, too. Bush there, and you had George Bush's son. He was right, yeah, but I still liked President Reagan. Make America great again. It's his, been his mantra since he's run in 2015. What does that mean? What is again? When was America great? Well, that question right there says everything that I need to know about, about you, that you don't really think America was ever great at any time. I think America. Okay, well, whatever. I mean, who cares? It's not about him. It's about what does the slogan mean? <laughs> so answer the question. America was great. The spirit, the whole purpose for America. But when? It's about the American spirit. Coming Specifically here and making when? something for yourself and having the opportunity to do that for yourself, to okay. work hard. And that's what that's America great. is all about. So the people... Good, good platitudes, but when was that? People that hate America will always say, well, when was it ever great? Right. It's just not a very good attitude to have, in my opinion. Okay, well, it's not an attitude, though. It's a question. <laughs> it's a question of if the slogan is make America great again, what past incarnation of America do we want to hearken back to? Because it's ultimately a regressive slogan, right? It's a regressive slogan that says, hey, America has wandered astray from greatness. So when were we great? And what exactly are you advocating we get back to? That's not a trick question. That's not some insane bullshit. It's a very specific question that deserves a very specific answer. As in, narrow it down to a year or at least a time period. Tell me what? Tell me when? When were we great? Opinion. I and mean, when was that lost in, in your estimation? Um, I think a lot of it was lost when the Federal Reserve took over the money system. Uh, we need to go back to a goal. Okay, let's see. Um, established in 1913. So America lost its greatness in 1913. So America literally has been dog shit for more than a century. Until Trump. 
even though he did not do, he didn't lift a pinky finger to get rid of the Federal Reserve. I don't even remember that being a piece of Trump rhetoric. Did Trump ever really, did Trump ever say he wanted to get rid of the Federal Reserve? I'm going to look that up. Donald Trump during his presidency expressed dissatisfaction with the Federal Reserve and its policies, particularly regarding interest rates. However, there's no in clear indication he advocated for completely abolishing the Federal Reserve. His criticism was mainly focused on the decision made by the Fed, uh, decisions made by the Fed, especially those related to interest rates and what he perceived as an impact on the economy. Trump's concerns were more about the direction of the Fed's policies rather than an outright call for its elimination. In terms of his stance on monetary policy, Trump did consider significant reforms. For instance, he pondered the idea of returning to the gold standard, a major shift from the current monetary system. This idea was part of a broader discussion about monetary reforms and not specifically about abolishing the Federal Reserve. Overall, while Trump was critical of the Federal Reserve and co contemplated uh, major monetary reforms, there is no substantial evidence to suggest that he pushed for complete abolition of the Federal Reserve during his presidency. His criticisms and proposals were more about changing the Fed's approach and policies rather than dismantling the institution itself. So here is the events as summarized by this woman. 1913, up until then, America great. Slavery, great. Genocide of the Native American populations, great. Exploitation of women and Chinese people and all that stuff, great, great, great. 1913 rolls along. We establish the Federal Reserve. <laughs> America, no longer great. America, shit. America is shit for a century until finally Donald Trump takes office and does nothing to abolish the Federal Reserve, doesn't lift a finger to try to abolish the Federal Reserve, and but somehow it was great even though the thing that made us bad is still in place, and then we got to get him back in there <laughs> because maybe this time he'll abolish it. I don't know. What does make America great again mean to you? It means uh, the... Uh uh, stopping the invasion of our nation by uh, illegal immigration. It means uh, uh, rebuilding our economy that's been destroyed by the Biden administration. I'm, how am I hearing an anti-immigration stance from a motherfucker that's literally so old that he probably came in on Ellis Island himself? This dude is 106 years old, an immigrant himself from Czechoslovakia, doesn't even, the country doesn't even exist anymore, going to tell me he hates immigrants. What's up with that? And it means uh, making us secure in the world again through our strength in the world that keeps the whole world in check. What does that okay. mean to you? The again part of that. When was it great? Farmers for Trump. Well, well why didn't you ask that old man what year? I want to know the year. That, that old timer was going to cook up some cockamamie shit. He was going to be like, it was best in 1777. <laughs> One year after the founding, I was there. To you. Supposed to have been great in the founding era. Um, then it got changed in the middle 1800s, and I won't go into all the details because that's too. Wow. <laughs> so this is my guy right here. Middle 1800s. Like 1850? That was the last time America was great? Dude's pining for an era he never fucking lived in. Man, you know when shit was good? 1850. But then all kinds of nonsense happened. <laughs> Too long of a story. But that was is it the Civil War? Is that when it was bad? When slavery ended? Is that what he's going to say? I mean, he is a farmer. Does he wish old black Joe was still picking cotton on his fucking plantation? What the fuck? That was, that, that was slavery in the Civil War. Very astute interview guy. It's a little different than that because in the late 1800s, the... Um, Manipulators bought out all the school publishers, and so they changed the, the narratives. And so that's when they changed the narratives. What? America was great then around that time. It's supposed to have been great up until. This guy's not even sure it was ever great. <laughs> this guy's like, it was supposedly it was. 
So this guy is really not a MAGA guy. I mean, at the end of the day, this is not a Make America Great Again guy because he's not even sure it ever was. This guy's just like, yeah, I mean, I think maybe it might have been all right around 1816, somewhere around about them parts. Supposedly, it was okay. Well, maybe up to the time of Andrew Jackson. And when was it great in your life? Oh, okay. Andrew Jackson. Okay. The most despotic and authoritarian president we ever had. That makes sense why he'd be a Trump supporter. A lifetime. Unfortunately, the cognitive dissonance is such that it actually never really was. I went through fear porn, Vietnam War, you know, duck and cover drills. I, mean, I kind of like this guy, to be honest with you. <laughs> he's a nut. He's a kook. But I like that. And he's got a beard. So, you know, whatever. Anyway, now that we've uh, gone through that, one person, I think, said the 80s. Tucker's really trying to sell that it's the 80s Trump is referencing. But this is just the Rorschach test of Make America Great Again. Nice, vague slogan, right? Nice, vague slogan that you can just insert anything you want into. 1860, 1821, 1913, 1980. Anytime you fucking want. Because Trump's never narrowed it down. Trump's never been like, we need to be back in... 1977 when star wars came <laughs> you know like he's never fucking narrowed it down wisely and everyone was enfranchised and everyone had rights but everyone was roughly not everyone but most people were sort of united in a sense of common purpose and culture everyone had rights in 1980 pretty sure gay people couldn't get married until the 2000s but whatever sure they were americans and they knew you know, their response to that, well, they could have got married to a woman. You know, that lesbian could marry a dude. That gay guy could marry a woman, you know, so they could still get married. They just couldn't do their weird blasphemous marriage, you know. <laughs> what that meant. We don't have that anymore. And that's Trump's vision. So you may not think that's possible. Um, this guy's really sidestepped the question of what your predictions are, though, hasn't he? For fuck's sake, put your ass on the line and fucking predict a thing. It's not like anything happens to you if you're wrong. Look at Tim Pool. How many wrong predictions is that guy under his belt? Tons. Tim Pool has pretty much never gotten a prediction correct. Never. Not one fucking time. Literally everything Tim Pool has ever predicted has spectacularly failed to come to pass. Hasn't hurt him. Still a super popular fucking podcast. So quit being such a pussy and throw a prediction out. Don't give me this bullshit. Oh, you know, it's hard. The times are confusing. And, uh. Come on. It's even virtuous to want that. But if you think that's a grotesque hellscape that he's describing, you're the freak, not him. And yet they all... I don't think he's just... The problem is he's not describing anything. That's why every single MAGA chud we just listened to has a completely fucking different idea of what Trump is really saying. They don't know. They don't know what he's saying. Neither do you. So you can't be like, I am the interpreter of the Trump and I know... The year of MAGA, the year that MAGA references is exactly the year of 1980. That is what we're talking about. 1980, folks. And is that so bad? The 80s gave us back to the future. The 80s gave us the rise of action heroes like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone. The 80s gave us some of the best practical movie effects of all time. The 80s gave us a booming Wall Street. The 80s gave us some of the most macho, manly times in American history. So how, if you don't like that, then you're just a piece of fucking shit. <clears throat> MAGA just allows everybody to look into the past, choose a spot that they would have rather lived, and say, ah, yeah. That's it. That's the ticket. That's the sweet spot. That's what Trump's really talking about. I'll feel that way. They mean it, too. They really feel that way. It's not a joke. 
And so what's gonna happen? And I guess I dissent a little bit from the much more optimistic view that you have, both of you, which I really appreciate hearing and I want to believe it, but that in the end, the will of the people matters. The conclusion that I've come to is that it matters less than it should. And that the people in power really do make the bulk of the decisions. And I say that after spending 35 years in Washington and watching the agenda of both parties and comparing that agenda to the public opinion polling of what people actually want and finding no union set. No union set. Like there's not the same agendas. That's true. Tucker Carlson has spoken the truth on this. That is true. And we have a democratic system where these people are elected every two years in the Congress, every six years in the Senate, every four years in the White House. And their agenda never changes. And the desires of the American public, by and large, are never met or even addressed. See, here's the thing I don't understand about this. Because what he just said is true. But he's acting like Trump is somehow a divergence. Now, he's a divergence in the sense that he tried to hold on to power after he lost the election. But really, in no other sense is he much of a divergence. Um, he had a very typical Republican administration that did typical Republican things. The major accomplishment of his administration is exactly the same thing as the major accomplishment of most Republican administrations. He cut taxes primarily on the rich and said, oh, this will stimulate the economy. And then, you know, it doesn't. Never worked, never has worked, never will work. But they keep doing it, not because they really genuinely believe it'll stimulate the economy, but because it pleases the donor class that funds them. So um, why is Trump being treated as though he's some sort of radical departure from the norm here? Because he's not. He's only a departure in the one sense we've already discussed. In every other sense, pretty typical Republican legislation, pretty typical Republican administration. And you sort of, after a while, conclude maybe it doesn't matter what people want. It only matters what the people in power want. I don't want to think that but I don't know what other conclusion to reach. So what you have now is a legit mass movement on behalf of Donald Trump that's 100% real, and you have absolute ironclad resistance to the democratic process working its way to a legitimate conclusion by the people who have all the power. What happens next? I don't even know. Yeah, I don't really think you get to talk about subversion of the democratic process as a Trump supporter because he's... <laughs> He was the biggest subverter of the democratic process that at least we've seen in our lifetimes and probably the, the worst in American history. So I don't really understand that line of logic. Now, I get it that you feel like uh, the Democrats are trying to artificially keep Trump off the ballot. And, you know, that's pretty much true. But um, that's probably because the motherfucker tried to take over the country when he was in office. <laughs> like, that's probably the reason that they're so reluctant to let him back in. Because they're like, eh, I don't know. If we, get the, if we let this guy back in there, maybe he's not going to leave. Now, I don't personally think Trump would have any success trying to, I don't know, take over the country or whatever. I don't think Trump could be like, well, my term's over, but I'm staying. Personally, I don't think he's going to live that long. But even if he did, I'm pretty sure he would not have any more success at an insurrection this time around than he did the first time. But um, acting like you are a great defender of the democratic process when you're literally trying to prop up a guy that denied the results of an election and said, oh, well, you know, I'm going to stay in power and I'm going to, you know, threaten election workers and uh, you know, put pressure on Mike Pence not to certify the results and do all this crazy shit that's totally unprecedented in American history. Um, seems a little bit, I don't know, hypocritical maybe. And I'll sum it up this way. All right, sum Today, it up. Today, it is a race in the foreseeable future between Donald Trump, the former president, mm -hmm. now effectively the Republican nominee. Has not made prediction one in his five minutes talking, by the way. He was asked to make predictions. He has not made a single fucking prediction. All he has done 
is suckle at the teat of Trump and talk about how Trump is going to restore us back to, you know, the 1980s and everything's going to be rad again. And we're going to be, you know, dancing it up, cutting the rug in Studio 54. And the incumbent president, president, they got more votes than Barack Obama somehow because um, he's just so popular. <laughs> it's just the magnetism. You and I both know, Tucker, that first of all, the population is higher. The voting population is higher now than it is than it was under Obama because the population has increased since then. But second of all, you also know that the people who went and voted for Joe Biden were not really going there to vote for Joe Biden. They were going there to vote against Donald Trump. The 2020 election was a referendum on Donald Trump. It was, hey, want more Trump or want this geriatric old fool? Um, and people said, I guess we'll take the geriatric fool. And at this point, I mean, really, even before Biden took office, um, Trump was already a geriatric fool himself. But compared to Biden, he seemed to have it together. But now Trump really seems like he's catching up to Biden in the dementia addled department. I don't know if you've been paying attention to Trump's recent speeches, but he is starting to sound dissociated. He is starting to sound befuddled. He is starting to sound like he doesn't really understand the words that are coming out of his mouth. And it's not just when he's reading off the teleprompter anymore, because he always sounded very awkward reading a prompter. But now he sounds awkward even just speaking off the cuff. He sounds like he doesn't even understand his own words half the time. And um, he's basically become almost as much of a shit show as Biden. And he's starting to look fucking horrible. So at this point, we are now faced with a choice of befuddled old man or befuddled, or <laughs> befuddled old orange man. And um, it's not looking good for America, in my opinion. I don't think we're in a good place right now. I feel like we're in a very negative space. And I don't think that Trump is the solution to that. And I really don't think Biden's the solution to that. I really don't think that most people would disagree with me on that conclusion. I think that if you really ask the majority of Americans that are not hardcore MAGA or hardcore anti-MAGA, the majority of people in this country would probably tell you the same thing I'm telling you right now, that this election is a fucking shit show and that no matter who wins, we lose. Um... He spent the entire 2020 campaign moldering and deteriorating in his basement. And somehow he was more popular than Barack Obama, right? He wasn't more popular than Barack Obama. Hatred for Trump was more popular than Barack Obama. Okay. Anyway, um, so it's the race between Biden and Obama. I just don't see that happening. I just don't. The race between Biden and Obama? And that, you know, I hope to be wrong. I want to return to normalcy too. I'm the opposite of a revolutionary too. That's what I love. What the fuck does return to normalcy even mean? When the fuck has this country ever had quote unquote normalcy? This country is a weird fucking place. And it's like half puritanical repressive regime and half like sex and drugs and degeneracy fueled nightmare. That's pretty much what it's always been from era to era, from time to time, no matter where you go in American history, it's pretty much been half Bible clutching. We need to get right with Jesus and half. I'm going to snort some blow off this hooker's ass. And a lot of times that's the same guy. The guy that's snorting blow off the hooker's ass Saturday night is in the pews Sunday morning begging for me. That's America. That is normal for us. Because we're a weird, fucked up bunch of kooks in this country. And you know what? I like that about us, personally. That makes me feel a little patriotic inside. about Trump? He doesn't want radical change. We're not... 
We're not actually made for radical change. We can't digest it. People hate radical change. They want kind of continuity, and I do too. But I just don't see this playing out the way it's currently formulated. Sorry. I think what he's trying to say is that he thinks Biden's going to win, but he doesn't want to just say Biden's going to win. He wants to hedge the bet. So instead, he's like, well, you know, the people clearly want Trump, but they're not going to get what they want because the powers that be. So basically just setting up for the next um, narrative after Trump loses again, which I don't know that he will, but it seems to me that Tucker thinks he will. And Tucker's already kind of like preparing for the worst. He's like, okay, I'm Tucker Carlson. I think Trump's going to lose. I don't want to come out there and predict that. So instead, I'm just going to say, oh, well, the powers that be might not let Trump take office. And then, you know, when Biden wins, if he does, Tucker Carlson will be like, see, told you the powers that be would steal the election from the people yet again. Keep listening to my show. <laughs> I mean, what a fucking ballless fucking sack, dude. This dude is an empty scrotum just dangling there with no fucking balls to fill it. What a sad, sad sack. See, so... And uh, I guess the whole time Tucker Carlson was talking... Waiting in the wings was our very good, very esteemed friend, Doctor. Well, maybe not Doctor for long. Mr. Jordan B. Peterson. Get ready for some word salad. What's your favorite dressing to put on word salad? We, that, and, and you, Tucker, you actually asked for a, an alternative to the view that you were expressing to some. You mean the lack of view that he expressed because he fucking didn't say shit. What pessimistic view of the dominance of people in power. Okay. In the video that led up to your entrance onto the stage, you pointed out a realization that you had, which was that nothing better in your life can happen to you than what happens if you tell the truth. And I, I believe that to be the case. I actually believe that that's why we have the idea that power is vested in the people. And I don't think that power is where people think it is. I don't think that power is in the hands of the elite. The ability to manipulate, misuse power might be in the hand of the elite, but the power that we need to set the world straight is actually at your fingertips. And this is actually, this is actually a rather terrifying realization, you know, because there's some relief in thinking that the elites can do whatever they want and there's nothing that someone as small as you could possibly do about it. And that's wrong because you're not small. And it's wrong because it's irresponsible to presume that. And it's wrong because the truth is more terrifying and also more liberating. And the truth of the matter is, is that if you utilized what you had at hand, which at least is the ability that you have at hand to say what you think truly and as clearly as you can, even if you're... All right. <laughs> oh my God. Do not lecture me on clarity, Mr. Fucking Word Salad. All right. I'm going to tell you the truth as I see it. The truth is, answer the fucking question. This old man, I don't know who he is. I don't know who the old man is on the stage. They ask these guys, like, what do you think's going to happen in 2024? Why must this old man be subjected to this meandering fucking nonsense about nothing? This is not a self-help fucking seminar. Oh, well, I think the power is in the people because... And then the power is in the hands of the people. And the only fucking thing the people are going to do with the power is choose one of the fucking two mainstream bullshit duopoly fucking candidates. That's what they're going to do with the fucking power. Trump or Biden, y'all. Your choice. That choice fucking sucks. If the power's really in my hands, I'd like a different choice.
I would like to choose between two better things. I'm tired of the lesser of two evils. I would like to choose the greater of two goods sometime. Could we fucking arrange for that? Could I get the better of two goods platter, please? I'm using my the power in my fingertips to make it happen. <clears throat> You're not that articulate that the world would change around you in ways that would make you immune to the blandishments of the power mongering elite. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm hoping that enough people will realize their, the power of their affinity with the truth, especially when it's allied with the will to aim up, to, to have the courage to speak that truth. And if enough people... Do I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I dream about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. Someone turn off the platitude machine, please. Someone please tell Jordan that he was not asked, hey, Jordan, give your little self-help speech, bro. I don't care about this. The motherfucker asked you guys to make predictions. Do you guys not know what the definition of a fucking prediction is? Do you not know what a prediction is? I'm just asking. A prediction is when you describe how you think a future event will transpire. It's not, I will describe what has already happened and I will describe how I view a Trump presidency. That's what Tucker seems to think a prediction is. And Jordan Peterson seems to think it's a fucking rousing speech about how the power is yours. Fuck you, Captain Planet. Make a fucking prediction for the love of fucking Christ. Make a fucking prediction. That's all you were asked to fucking do. Do that. Then the terrible things that we're concerned about coming forward at us in the future will have no purchase whatsoever. That's great. You know, like I learned a long time wow. ago. That Me too. the war that we're in is psychological or spiritual. Uh, yeah, if you it's want a to spiritual look at it that war, yeah. So rather true. than political. And everyone has a sense of that now, that it's something is moving that's more that's deeper than the mere political. The tectonic plates themselves are shifting. And you you're all going to play a role in that, you know? And the role you'll play is going to be determined by what you determine to ally your speech with, for example, your decision about whether or not you're going to tell the truth in the confines of your own life. And if enough people, all of you, if enough of you decide in the local circumstances of your own life to say, to dare to say what you believe to be true, then the tyrants will have no purchase on you and you won't be slaves. And just by definition, Hey, can I just, uh, that, no, I just want to say what a beautiful sentiment I think that is, and I wish I had said that, and I, I'm so thankful that you said that. Well, you know what, Jordan Peterson, that was some of the finest word salad I've ever heard someone shit out of their fucking empty head, bro. I wish that I had said something so completely banal, ponderous, and empty. That was gorgeous, man. The way it's the way that you said a continuous stream of words, but conveyed ultimately nothing. That's great. What a fucking icon. You should be lifted up upon the highest hill. A golden ray should shine down from heaven upon your vaunted form, Jordan Peterson. That was gorgeous. That was so gorgeous, I would just drink it up like a velvety wine and go frolicking through the spring meadow. Fuck. Me! Neither one of them made a prediction. Neither one of them made a fucking prediction. They were asked, both of them. Hey guys, got any predictions? Neither one of them. <laughs> Had a fucking prediction. <sighs> All right. Here's my 2024 predictions. 
Donald Trump and Joe Biden are going to kill each other. They're going to have a duel and they're going to shoot each other in the fucking head and they're both going to die. And two better candidates will step up and America will be saved by one of the two much better candidates because they're both going to be amazing. They're both going to be fucking great. They're both going to make sense. And it's honestly going to be a difficult choice. Oh, I don't know. Oh, shit. Oh, man. They're both so good. Both so rational and intelligent, but radically different visions for America's future. What do we do? That's my prediction. It's going to be fucking wrong. But at least it's a fucking prediction. At least I did the assignment. See you, man.